Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show. This is Tony. It's great to have you listening to us today. Our website is a minute to midnight.com with midnight spelt M I D N I T E. And we put all our shows and articles there as well as YouTube and iTunes. And today's show is a real interesting one, it's something different. I have Joel Richardson and Bill Sawless on together and a very interesting subject, which is Mystery Babylon, Mecca or Rome. Hope you enjoy it, and I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. I want to welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show, uh, Bill Sawless. We've had Bill on the show before, and Joel Richardson, and so it's a bit of a treat. We haven't had Joel on uh, a Minute to Midnight show before, but now to have the two of you guys together is pretty awesome, and I've re- I've been really looking forward to this discussion, so I want to welcome you both. Uh, so, Bill, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Tony, and we have we have with us, like you said, Joel Richardson. Joel is a New York Times bestselling author, and he's got a really interesting book with a lot of great research on Mystery Babylon, which will be the subject of our conversation today. It's called Mystery Babylon, Unlocking the Bible's Greatest Prophetic Mysteries. It was a bestseller as well, and he's done an enormous amount of research. Joel and I uh, have done a debate together, called, the, and we have a DVD available through our websites and on Amazon called The Identity of Mystery Babylon, Mecca or Rome. He takes the Mecca perspective and I go, you know, go with the Rome view. Uh, but, you know, Joel is a great speaker and a good brother in the Lord. We just happen to share a couple different opinions on who the identity of the harlot world religion is. So welcome, Joel, as well. It's great to have you on today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Bill, for the introduction. And uh, Tony, it's a, it's a blessing to be on with both of you. Yes, and I'm sure it's going to be an absolutely fascinating discussion and that it will go along very quickly. So it's it's interesting. I mean, you've both written books uh, on this subject. Joel, your book is called Mystery Babylon, Unlocking the Bible's Greatest Prophetic Mystery. And, um, and Bill, yours is Apocalypse Road, Revelation for the Final Generation. But you've also done a DVD um, that covers a kind of a debate with the, the two of you. Do you want to just give a brief introduction into what that DVD is? Yeah, Joe, go ahead. You you produced a wonderful DVD here. Do you want to tell them a little bit about it? Yeah, so um, in November 2017, Bill and I were invited through a ministry called Southwest Radio Ministries. We met in the uh, historic town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and we had essentially a three-hour uh, debate. Uh, it was it was a to me it was a tremendous blessing because it was done with such a spirit of Christ likeness um, in terms of honoring one another. It was just a really edifying discussion, and um, everybody so far that I have uh, talked to that's watched it just said it was very helpful, very educational, and very edifying. Also, I would add to that that it's it's very educational too. Uh, enormous amount of research has been compiled from both perspectives, and new things were introduced uh, about different times types of chronology of the way to read the Book of Revelation, um, things like that. So, the DVD is very instructional, educational, and informative as well. Ah, uh, that's great. And maybe you very briefly could mention where you can actually get that from before we discuss it. Uh, sure. It's on Amazon.com under the identity of Mystery Babylon. It's uh, Joel's got it at his website. I'll let him plug that in just a moment. And it's also at my website, prophecydepot.com. Joel, where's your website? Um, I'm at joelstrumpet.com. Okay, so Joel, um, I'm interested in, I've heard you speak a little bit on this. The first thing that really I want to very quickly get into is the Nimrod myth. What is this? Yeah, so essentially if you read any number of thousands of articles uh, on the internet, or it's frequently discussed in a lot of popular Christian prophecy books on the topic of Mystery Babylon, there's something that I call the Nimrod myth, which is sort of this whole narrative, this whole story regarding ancient Babylonian religion, uh, regarding this character Nimrod. And according to this 
this story, Nimrod founded the ancient Babylonian religion with his wife named Semiramis, and they had a child named Tammuz, who actually is sort of a reincarnation of Nimrod. According to the story, Semiramis killed uh, Nimrod, but then he was reborn as Tammuz and so forth. And it's a it's an incredibly involved, detailed story. And what I uh, discuss in the book is that despite the fact that this is widely received, I mean, just accepted as fact by many, many Christians within particularly prophecy-focused circles, it really has no basis in the scriptures. In fact, the entire foundation for this narrative is found in uh, a number of extra-biblical traditions, most of which start around the second century B.C., and they, it's continued to expand right up until modern times. And so I really challenge people to say we need to be careful not to interpret Revelation based on the Nimrod myth. Rather, our interpretation needs to be rooted in the scriptures. I must say, Joel, that, you know, I've kind of followed that same thinking somewhat about the, uh, you know, the Tammuz and, and, and Nimrod and Semiramis. And I know that former Illuminists were actually taught that. I've heard that, that uh, you know, the people that were brought up in Illuminati or Illuminist families, they were actually taught that. So it's, it's definitely old and it goes through the whole Masonic sort of teaching line. So uh, I'm, I'm certainly interested to, to see that you, well, you discount it. The Talmud... Uh, and the Kabbalah, how much are they influencing, you know, the prophecy schools today? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the Talmud, for instance, talks quite a bit about the Nimrod. Uh, it, it, it covers the Nimrod myth, so to speak. But what's interesting, and this is one of the reasons why I encourage people to be extremely cautious, um, is because when we look at the Nimrod stories regarding, uh, the Talmudic stories regarding Nimrod, they're incredibly contradictory. Some of the stories, for instance, cast Nimrod as a godly man. Uh, others cast him in a very negative light who is uh, contending with Abraham and this sort of thing. Uh, you know, ultimately, this is an issue that it, it, it culminates with Alexander Hislop. And um, it's amazing the degree to which Alexander Hislop's um, book, uh, The Two Babylons, has really influenced popular Protestant consciousness. And not just um, Alexander Hislop, but also another fellow named Alberto Rivera. I'll just mention this because it was interesting that in the middle of the debate, we took a little break and a woman came up to me and she handed me this comic book. It was a comic book that had been created by Jack Chick. And it was based on the life of Alberto Rivera. Um, Alberto Rivera essentially teaches that Islam was created by Rome. And so it's, she actually asked a question at the end, and she said, she said, it she actually wasn't a question, it was a statement. And she said, Islam was created by Rome, it's all a giant cover-up. So the idea is that once the Vatican, once Rome is, is sort of cast as the greatest evil, then there's a problem when you have another evil that rises in the earth. It has to somehow be brought under the umbrella uh, of Rome. Of course, Alberto Rivera was exposed as a fraud. He had warrants out for um, in multiple states for all sorts of financial fraud. His entire story of claiming to be a former priest was all shown to be um, uh, fraudulent, and um, he was basically fleecing the church. And in the same way, um, I would argue that when we really carefully analyze Alexander Hislop's material, it's incredibly, uh, it's filled with anachronisms, historical fallacies, and just really irrational, illogical thought. So, you know, again, um, you know, I, I'm not sure about these Illuminists. I actually question whether a lot of them are legitimate if they were brought up in Illuminist families or if they were just sort of new age-ish uh, families and this sort of thing. Unfortunately, in the church, there are a lot of people who um, they make a, a, a good living telling stories. Um, and I'm, I'm a very skeptical person, so I, I naturally tend to question uh, these things when I hear them. I agree. There are a lot of frauds passing themselves off as Illuminous, but there are also some genuine ones. Uh, that I know have not made any money out of it. In fact, they've 
got it's been the opposite. They've been hounded and fa- and made life extremely difficult for them. But okay, Bill, um, why do you believe Mystery Babylon is the Catholic Church? Okay, yeah. Yes, Tony. Um, my reason for arguing for Rome's position uh, is multifold. I mean, it starts with the fact that throughout history, throughout the church age, the church fathers like Lactantinius, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Jerome, even the re- reformers, Martin Luther, John Knox, John Calvin, John Tyndale, John Wyclef, and our contemporaries, many of them, J. Vernon McGee, J. J. Dwight Pentecost, Larkin, Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, Dr. David Reagan, Dave Hunt, I mean, the list goes on, Ed Henson. Uh, they all subscribe to the teachings that the great city of the harlot is Rome. The other thing that comes up for me is that when you take a close look at the, the primary proof text, uh, you're dealing with Revelation 17, uh, Mystery Babylon spells out several things to us um, where we talk about the mysteries explained to John by the angel. It sits, it's a city that sits on seven hills, uh, which is, of course, the the notorious uh, historical name for Rome, the city that sat on seven hills. Uh, even at the time, Joel points out in his book, there was a, uh, the goddess Roma was on coinage uh, as sitting and lounging on seven hills. And uh, so the other thing, too, that comes up with this is that you got to deal with a, a future world religion at a time where supernatural deception is no longer being restrained by Satan. In my estimation, that's in Second Thessalonians 2, where he no longer is restrained to put forward his closing arguments, to put forward his point man, the Antichrist, the lawless one, where you have uh, lying signs and wonders and satanic supernatural deception. So we have to look at, well, what would be the composite of this religion in the end times when the supernatural is the natural, the paranormal is the new normal? And we find that this this religion has got idolatry to it. It says that the kings of the earth commit fornication with her, the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with her fornication, and, and Joel and I both agree that is dealing with spiritual idolatry. And then also we're told in Revelation uh, 18 that the, she is judged uh, her sins are piled as high as heaven and God has remembered her crime. So we have to look at, you know, well, which religion would has a, a real bad rap sheet throughout the church age that would, you know, be have to be judged, you know. And, and of course, I look at the the crimes that with, you know, pagan Rome then morphed into papal Rome. They put to death God's son, pagan Rome, Jesus Christ. They martyred Christians for three centuries. They killed 1.1 million, mostly Jews around the time, according to Josephus around 70 AD, uh, destroyed the temple, the city of Jerusalem. And did it again in 70 AD, 135 AD was repeated, uh, Jerusalem destruction. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews around that time. And then Papal Rome expelled Jews from Spain in 1492 AD, expelled Jews from Portugal five years later, killed tens of thousands of Jews in the Crusades, killed hundreds of thousands of Protestants for hundreds of years. Some estimates could be in the millions during the Inquisitions. Uh, responsible for as many as 100,000 victims of sexual abuse in the United States alone. What about worldwide? And then Joel puts forward some good points too with respect to the idolatry and the crimes of Islam, too. So there's definitely uh, competing theories that Joel and I have on this. Joel, so you um, you believe the Antichrist, I, I take it, is Islamic and that uh, Mecca is Mystery Babylon. Could you explain maybe your point of view there? Sure. Yeah, well, it's 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 very difficult to discuss the identity of Mystery Babylon without touching on the issue of the Antichrist. Obviously, uh, the two are, you know, integrally related because I believe that um, the primary religion of the Antichrist and the primary nations which will comprise the coming Antichrist kingdom are all specified throughout the prophets as being Middle Eastern, North African nations. Um, then sort of the next logical step is to ask, well, what is the spiritual and financial or economic capital or heart of this Islamic empire, of this Islamic religion. So my theory begins, my, the, my conclusion begins with the theory that the Antichrist, his empire and his religion are clearly specified throughout the scriptures as being Middle Eastern and having a very Islamic 
nature, whether it be doctrinally, whether it be the practice of beheading. Uh, doctrinally, Islam denies the Father and the Son, which is exactly what the Apostle John uh, specifies as the doctrines of the Antichrist. So once you uh, arrive at that conclusion that the Antichrist uh, will have a Muslim or Middle Eastern characteristic, then the question is very simple. What is the financial and spiritual heart of the Islamic world? Uh, it's not to say that you couldn't arrive at some different conclusions. You could arrive at a literal Babylon. Some people might point to Istanbul. I conclude that Mecca and the larger kingdom of Saudi Arabia would be the best candidates. And uh, again, you know, when you go down the scriptural criteria, you go down the list, Mecca fulfills those biblical criteria, in my opinion, far better than any of the other candidates. Um, for instance, Saudi Arabia is indeed an economic powerhouse that holds sway over the kings of the earth. Saudi Arabia is the single greatest lobby power in Washington, presidents, senators, American corporations, media, and so forth, um, in many ways controlled by the Saudi lobby power, the, the, the largest lobby financially uh, in the history of the country. Um, spiritually speaking, when you compare, you know, again, Islam to uh, Rome, because this is very important, Mystery Babylon is the great harlot. It's the mother of all harlots. It's the biggest, it's the supreme false religion. Uh, Islam at 1.8 billion right now is much larger than global Catholicism. It is undeniably the single greatest false religion, not only in the earth today, but really down throughout history, in the history of mankind. And so whether we're talking about the great false religion or the great economic influencer, uh, Islam fulfills that criteria, uh, in my opinion, much better than any of the other uh, possible candidates that are out there. Um, well, uh, my question here is in Revelation, uh, <clears throat> we're going back to chapter 13, um, and it says that um, telling all those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, and and then we get into the, you know, no one can buy or sell without the mark. Islam does not allow the creation of is, of images to be worshipped. It's forbidden. Uh, some might say that the black stone at Mecca, um, that they worship it, but Muslims themselves say, no, they don't. It's only a marker. So if Islam is, if you're not allowed to worship an image, how are they going to set up an image and worship it? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Well, there's two words there in the Greek that we need to focus on. The first is proskuneo, which um, it most often means worship, but it quite frequently doesn't. Uh, it could just mean bow down to, pay homage to. For instance, in Revelation 2, Jesus himself says, I will cause those who say, um, they're from the synagogue of Satan, he says, I will cause them to bow down before you. That's the same word. Now, obviously, Jesus is not saying I'm going to make people worship you uh, to other believers. And so in this case, it says it will cause the inhabitants of the world to bow down before this image. Now, um, an image is oftentimes uh, throughout the Bible anthropomorphic, which is to say, you know, we imagine a statue, but it's not always. Um, it could be something as simple as an obelisk, uh, or a flag or a symbol. It is something uh, that re that represents another god. So it's interesting because, and this is just pure speculation. I'll throw this out there. It says the false prophet will set up an image. Now, again, this could be something like a flag. It could be something that represents this false god. And it says, I'll cause all the peoples of the world to bow down before it, and otherwise they won't be able to bow uh, to buy or sell. Now, John says, and it will be given a voice to speak. Now, you think about this, up on the Temple Mount today or all over the Islamic world, um, the religion of Islam has set up these mosques. You could go to you know, Istanbul, formerly Constantinople, the largest church in the world. And what do they put up? They put up these minarets, which every day, five times a day, these minarets are given a voice to speak. They have megaphones. And they cry out and they say, everybody come and bow down in prayer to this false god, Allah. And so, you know, you say, well, what was John seeing or what was being described? 
And it would not at all surprise me if essentially he was seeing this, that these these images, these minarets, if you will, with the crescent moon, which is the symbol of Islam, and which is also the symbol for Satan, by the way, in Isaiah 14. Um, this is where we get the word Lucifer. It's actually a mistranslation. In the Hebrew, it's Hilal ben Sahar, which the in Arabic, that crescent moon is called the Hilal. Um, which basically means sort of the sun of the, of the morning star. And every day, five times a day throughout the world, b- billions of people bow down in front of or toward Mecca, which is really the great idol, the greatest idol in the earth right now. And so it's not anthropomorphic. It's not shaped like a man, although we often imagine that's what Revelation's talking about. But we can see how Islam does in many ways potentially fulfill that and how it might be fulfilled in a much more specific way in the future when the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, arise. Um, and so, Bill, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, Roman Catholics wouldn't have any problem with people falling down to, to an image. No, and of course, we're you're dealing with a segment in Revelation 13 with the Antichrist. Um, and I, wanna, I just want to make a comment here real quick because we do have limited time on the show and the debate was three hours. Joel and I, in this show with you, Tony, are being quite conciliatory, and we are brothers in the Lord, but I do want to let your listeners know, in the debate, we do take our gloves off a little bit. You know, Joel and I do kind of come at each other point by point in these areas. Uh, One of the points that we, of contention, that he and I had is dealing with really the claim that he says that Islam is the most pagan, you know, false religion throughout history. And you know, I, I pointed forward that when we deal with the supernatural idolatry and the, the crimes and sins of Rome. You know, Rome fits that bill, in my estimation, equally or greater than Islam. You know, so for instance, Marian apparitions, Eucharistic miracles, these are true supernatural phenomena that uh, lead to deception that would that I believe are easily in place throughout the church age for Satan to come forward with and embrace, and he's probably instrumental in those things. I don't believe that's the real Mary that shows up. And she's shown up throughout the church age, this Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Fatima, the Queen of All, the Virgin Mary. Uh, She's shown up in 1531 in Guadalupe, Mexico, whoever she is. 1858, Lords, France. 1970, 17, just an anniversary, 100-year anniversary in Fatima. And recently, in 1968 to 1970, in Zaytun, Egypt, over a Coptic church in a suburb of Cairo in Zaytun, Egypt. And when that happened, I write in my book, Apocalypse Road, it says, for more than a year, starting on the eve of Tuesday, April 2nd, 1968, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared in different forms over the domes of the Coptic church, named after her at Zaytun. The late Father Constantine Musa was the church priest at the time of the apparitions, and he his testimony was that the apparitions lasted from a few minutes up to several hours and were sometimes accompanied by luminous heavenly bodies shaped like doves and moving at high speeds. The apparitions were seen by millions of Egyptians, foreigners. Among the witnesses, wit- witnesses were Orthodox Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Jews, and non-religious people from all walks of life. But get this, the sick were cured and blind persons were receiving the sight. But most importantly, large numbers of believers were converted to, you know, predominantly Catholicism. And uh, good friends of mine, Roger Oakland, Brad Myers, and Jim Tetlow write about these apparitions in their book, Queen of All, which is a great book on Kindle. It says, numerous healings and miracles have been reported at apparition sites around the globe. In addition, the apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary has repeatedly announced that her most significant signs and wonders are yet future. She admits that she has not yet revealed her full glory to the world. She predicts heavenly signs and wonders that the whole world will soon witness. And then my last quote from the apparition uh, visionary herself, this you know blessed mother, who I undoubtedly do not believe is you know Mary, the mother of Jesus, but it's the Catholic Church teaches she is. She says, I wish to tell you that before my apparitions end completely, I shall be seen by every denomination and religion throughout this world. I will be seen among all peoples, not for just a moment, but everyone will have a chance to see me as I appeared in Zaytun. And again, that was just hardly 50 years ago. And she says, I shall appear again so everyone may see me 
pray and help my plans to be realized, not just here, but throughout the world. So, you know, the, the DVD is incredible. The debate is interesting. Uh, Joel and I point out, he put in some good arguments on the paganism of Islam. Uh, these are a few I put forward on Catholicism. Well, the um, the crescent moon, for example, um, was mentioned by Joel recently as being a symbol of Islam, but that symbol actually way predates Islam. You can see it, you know, throughout ancient history associated with goddess worship and, you know, Ishtar, etc. And that, today we see the worship of Gaia or Mother Earth basically becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Uh, and, and the Catholic Church, as you mentioned, Bill, worships Mary. So we have this kind of goddess religion thing coming through everywhere. And, and, you know, personally, I'm wondering if it all melds together some way, if we just don't see all the pieces yet. But but essentially, somehow all of this will be converted into one global religion that embraces Islam, Catholicism, the New Age, e- everything. Some people argue that this this is a super church. You know, uh, Mark Hitchcock would be one of those and others. Uh, you know, my problem with that is how, you know, th- they would also come along and say that, because it says in Revelation 17, 16, that the 10 kings uh, will desolate the harlot. You know, so th- when, when the harlot world religion, who is in an alliance with the Antichrist, we're told in Revelation 17, verse 3, that she sits on the beast. You know, he's in a, a subservient position initially when he comes on the scene, supports her. It says that in v- verse 7 of Revelation 17 that the beast carries her to her heights. But at some point, the harlot world religion becomes problematic, and the ten kings desolate her, and then that's when you move into the Antichrist scenario. I I believe you shift to Revelation 13, as you read earlier. But how do you kill a super church? How How do you destroy Wicca and, you know, Hinduism and Buddhism and all this sort of thing? You know, you you could easily uh, destroy Roman Catholicism by taking out its popes, its bishops, its cardinals, etc. So one of the problems I have with the super church ecumenical theory is that. I mean, I just don't see 10 kings being able to go out throughout the world and destroy all world religions. Now, will the will there be a canopy, and I believe there will be, of ecumenicism, uh, through the Catholic Church, I believe so. However, they will not succumb to, you know, uh, the t- different forms of paganism in those religions. They will still point people to the them being the one true church. And, you know, you can't be saved alone just in faith in Jesus Christ, according to the Catholic Church. Their Baltimore catechisms talk about in, in order to be saved, you must uh, also keep the commandments of God and of the Catholic Church. And the chief commandments of the Church are six to hear Mass on Sundays and the six holy days of obligation, to fast and abstain on the days appointed, to confess at least once a year, to receive the Holy Eucharist during the Easter time, to contribute to the support of our pastors and not to marry persons who are not Catholic. And they go on to say it's actually a mortal sin not to hear Mass on a Sunday. And, and you know, mortal sin can send you to, you know, Hades. And then the, the Eucharist is a whole other mystical experience for them. They actually believe that Jesus Christ comes from the right-hand side of the throne of God in heaven right now at the beck and call of the Pope, the bishops, the cardinals, and the priests, and literally, physically, his presence inhabits the bread and the wafer, the elements of the Mass. And you have to participate that in that every Sunday. Your own, your salvation is only as good as your last Mass, Tony. So, I mean, I think we, we need to look at both of Joel's and my theories quite seriously because we've got the idolatry, we've got the crimes and sins, the supernatural deception, and I think when you narrow it down, the two arguments that are pretty sound would be Joel's and mine. Uh, I just weigh the evidence in, in the side of Roman Catholicism. So, Joel, Jeremiah fifty twenty three uh, basically calls Babylon the hammer of the whole earth. Um, does Islam fit that? Well, in many ways, you know, throughout history, it's interesting. The Lord uses pagan empires as his hammer or his rod of chastisement against his own people. And in my opinion, presently, the Babylon of our time is indeed Islam. The Lord is using Islam as his rod of chastisement against Israel, against his people, the body of Christ. He's using it to uh, to test us, if you will, and against the whole world. And, and I would even add, in many ways, against the New World Order. You know... We oftentimes, it's interesting in discussions like this, we, we often have this idea 
that the system of the Antichrist will be this broad umbrella that will be able to bring all of the various incredibly contradictory uh, philosophies and world religions all into one camp. And so we say, well, Mary will somehow be able to bring Islam all under this one umbrella. The difficulty with that that I personally find, and we're getting into uh, the discussion of what we can imagine. We, we don't interpret the Bible based on what we can imagine, but it does make for interesting conversation. As people say, well, like, you know, the Antichrist could never be a Muslim because I cannot imagine um, Muslims bowing down to a man. Or, you know, we have these different ideas. But the bottom line is Muslims are never going to submit to some sort of New Age world religion. They're never going to willingly submit to uh, some sort of a religion which is um, based on Marian apparitions and this sort of thing. So the problem when we have this sort of all-encompassing idea, rather than just viewing the end times as incredibly messy, in my opinion, the world is messy today, and it will continue to get messier in the end times. We sometimes have this very polarized view. Everyone is either going to be a believer or an unbeliever. Um, the problem with that is we need to create a mechanism to remove Islam from the picture. Because Islam is a problem. You have these people which are bound and determined to stick to their religion. And so this is what happens is as we have, you know, these sort of prophetic scenarios that we picture in our head, we have to find a way to get Islam out of the world. Because otherwise, no matter what theory we offer, it's very problematic. And so the primary ways that people have done that is they've created, in my opinion, um, they've misinterpreted some key texts, most, most commonly, Revela uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 38 and 39, um, and then in Bill's case, he deals with Psalm 83, and we have these ideas that through these various battles, Islam's going to sort of get diminished and go away, and as I detail thoroughly in Mideast Beast, and as I touched on in the debate, it just doesn't work. Um, those, those passages, when we try to say they are these preliminary battles before the Antichrist, deeply problematic because all of the nations listed in Psalm 83 are all elsewhere clearly described as being judged and, and, and decimated at the time that Jesus returns, not several years before. The charismatics, they have uh, their mechanism to get rid of Islam. Usually they say, well, there's just going to be this great revival. Uh, all the Muslims are going to convert. Islam's going to go away. One of the reasons why I even focus on prophecy is because I believe the church is still living in denial with regard to Islam. We're trying to figure out some way where it's just going to go away. And I think we need to come to terms with reality and realize that Islam is the great Goliath that the Lord has, is using as his rod of chastisement. And he'll use it again against Israel, against his people, and against the world. And we need to face up, you know, uh, come to terms with reality and then develop not just a, a proper heart response, a Christ-centered, gospel-centered heart response, but also a very specific strategy in terms of how to confront this great Goliath at the end of the age. What if, um, if the literal city of Babylon doesn't actually exist yet? Uh, I, I'm I've been watching very closely from in Saudi Arabia the talk about the building a new mega city, smart city called Neom, under the guidance of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, which who will soon be king, probably, he's destined to be the king of Saudi Arabia, and um, in his own words, he he said um, he wants the kingdom to be a country of moderate Islam that is open to the world and open to all religions. As for extremist ideas, we will destroy them today, the Crown Prince said that was late last year. And we want the main robot to be the first robot in Neom Robot Number 1, the Crown Prince said. Everything will have a link with artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. Everything. And the two guys that are basically coordinating this NEOM project are, are died in the wool globalist Council on Foreign Relations Illuminist, basically Illuminati kind of members, New World Order guys, working in with the Crown Prince to develop the city. What if Mystery Babylon 
ends up to be a city neom in Saudi Arabia uh, that springs up incredibly quickly and becomes like a city that the earth has never seen before because they're um, intending to have it sort of done by 25, 2025 or 2030. So could we be jumping the gun and actually saying Mystery Babylon has to be something we see now when perhaps something else completely different could spring up and be that great city that we see in Revelation 17 and 18? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that, Joel. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is very important that we that we don't, as you said, jump the gun and assume that current world circumstances will continue, that, you know, anything can emerge in the future. But um, no, the city, Neom, is fascinating to watch. It's interesting to note that it would be built around the site of what many people believe is the real Mount Sinai. So it would be up there in the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia, very close to Jordan and Israel and Egypt. Um, and it would be, you know, again, this incredibly, as you said, uh, technologically advanced smart city. And the laws there, he wants to make the laws very different than the rest of Saudi Arabia um, to where all sorts of internationals could come and uh, it wouldn't have all of the religious restrictions that the rest of Saudi Arabia does. That He would actually, he's talking about opening up tourism to Saudi Arabia. So that is definitely a city to watch. Again, my only uh, skepticism there is that it does not have the, the uh, religious or idolatrous component that only Mecca can fulfill. You know, you think today 1.8 billion people all over the earth bowed down five times a day to that great idol. But nevertheless, um, it fulfills many of the descriptions of this great seaport, this great economic powerhouse, and it would be right there, you know, in the heart of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So it's it's definitely interesting, definitely something uh, to watch. Bill, have you got any thoughts about that? Um, Joel, seem, Joel thinks that only Islam uh, has the potential there uh, to be basically the idolatrous religion, but you also you believe I, that it is the Catholic Church. Um, is Rome a significant enough city to actually be that great city that everyone marvels at when it's destroyed? Well, <clears throat> it is because Rome actually has the greater history when you look way back, as I quoted the people who've been advocating that Rome is the mystery of Babylon through the church fathers on through the modern day contemporaries. The supernatural elements are there as well. We could take the Eucharist, for instance. I want to make a comment on a couple things real quick, and then I want to answer that question in a little bit of detail. Um, one is that, you know, when you talk about a, is a non-existent city presently, um, you know, some people advocate, well, it's going to be a rebuilt Babylon, Iraq. Well, you know, that city would have to be rebuilt to be the mega city to fulfill Babylon. That doesn't mean it couldn't be. Dubai was built quickly. Uh, you talk about Neom, that could be built quickly. But again, Joel and I emphasize that these things, you know, the destruction of the Catholic Church today or the destruction of Saudi Arabia today would not send the world into a, a downward monetary economic spiral. What we're dealing with is a future event when when the destruction of the the mystery babylon will send the world into a downward economic spiral that those kind of concerns so presently you know talking about you know things are shifting right now in dubai for instance and elsewhere in the in the arab world there there's a concern about the petrodollar uh, oil is no longer the going to always be necessarily the mainstay for those places so there's, there's a lot of more shifting toward tourism now and things like that you know we don't know what the geopolitical and economic scenario is going to shift toward at that point but with respect to the other thing he mentioned about the fact that the Muslim countries, uh, there's 10 of them in Psalm 83, roughly populations listed. There's nine in uh, Ezekiel 38. Uh, I, I believe Russia's one, they wouldn't necessarily be Muslim, but the other ones appear to be Muslim in general. Um, you know, he believes that they go into, you know, those are not taken out in a layered sequence. Like I say, they're going to be go through the Muslim wars of Psalm 83, be defeated by the IDF, then there's going to be Ezekiel 38, uh, defeated by the Lord. And by the time we get into the tribulation, Islam has been compromised dramatically. Allah has lost his Akbar. Uh, you know, so that's a whole other topic of debate. So uh, Joel's written about it. And of course, I've got a book on Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. That, that your, your listeners can go to those. With respects to the, uh, 
the other thing, though, basically the supernatural aspects, one of the things is these Eucharistic miracles, you know, that Jesus Christ supposedly comes and inhabits the elements. And, you know, here's a, just a quote from the back of a book called Eucharistic Miracles by Joan Carol Cruz. And the Eucharist is a big deal because, you know, people were, lost their lives uh, for this during the Inquisition periods. It was one of the reasons they were considered heretics. So Joan Cruz writes dealing with supernatural deception, the idolatry aspect of the harlot, on the back cover on numerous occasions in the history of the church, God has seen fit in order to offer miraculous visible proof of the Catholic teaching that the sacred words of consecration of the mass, the bread and the wine upon the altar are truly changed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. She recounts on her book, 36 Major Eucharistic Miracles, she tells of hosts which have turned into the flesh, hosts that have bled, hosts that have levitated, hosts that have manifested into mysterious lights and consecrated wine, which has turned into visible blood. These, these are not myths. These have really happened. Now, uh, J.C. Riles, who was the first Anglican Bishop of Liverpool, who was between 1816 and 1900, he writes that the principal reason why our reformers were burned was because they refused one of the peculiar doctrines of the Romish church. Now get this, the principal reason, he says, one of the particular, the peculiar doctrines of the Romish church. On that doctrine, in almost every case, hinged their life or death. If they admitted it, they might live. If they refused it, they must, they must die. The doctrine in question was the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in the consecrated elements of the bread, wine, and Lord's Supper. People are shocked when I say to them, <clears throat> people actually during the Inquisitions were, would be execute, executed for denying the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So, you know, there, there is definitely a history with the Catholic Church, uh, supernatural idolatry, Marian apparitions, you know. The harlot is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, it says in Revelation 17, 6. Now, I personally believe that's, that's twofold, historical, blood of the saints, I would say that would be during the Inquisitions, and the martyrs of Jesus, yet future, because there's a lot of martyrdom going on of, of true believers during the, the Christian, during the uh, tribulation period. So uh, I know Joel has a different interpretation of that, but of course that's what's interesting about our DVD, we get into those discussions. And uh, in Revelation 13, it says, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. Uh, I, I think back to in Luke chapter 4, where the devil takes Jesus, you know, and gives him three temptations. And one of them, he says, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom, whomever I wish. Therefore, if you'll worship me, all will be yours. Joel, is Satan or Lucifer, I mean, you know, many, many cultures like the Freemasons and all of the mystery school people, they actually worship a literal Lucifer. Is Satan going to be content to be called Allah in the end and and be worshipped as some sort of proxy, or is he going to be want to be to be worshipped as who he truly is? You know, throughout history, Satan has uh, sought to be worshipped under the guise of various pagan gods. He would be called Marduk. He would be called Sin or Baal, and this sort of thing. But it's interesting that in these last days with Islam, uh, again, the, the largest, greatest false religion that mankind has ever produced, he's no longer a competitor to Jehovah or Yahweh, the, the God of the Bible. Rather, he, he's actually masquerading as the God of the Bible. He's pretending to be the God of the Bible. He says, the God of the Quran says that he is the father um, or the God of, of Abraham. And so, in my opinion, Satan has always received false worship through the names under the guise of other various false gods. And I, uh, I think, likewise, with Islam today, um, the Allah of the Quran, in my opinion, uh, if it's not Satan himself, then it is a profound principality through which Satan is receiving false worship. Um, you know, and if 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 I might, one one of the issues that came up during the debate, and I'm sort of piggybacking off of some of the things that Bill just said. Um, when we look at Rome today, um, Bill is essentially setting forth the idea that it will be primarily through Roman Catholic 
Eucharistic miracles that the Eucharist is the uh, actual presence and body and blood of Christ, Marian apparitions and this sort of thing. Um, and one of the issues that came up, and I, I kept pointing it out, is I said, you know, I'm a futurist. And what that means is I believe that the book of Revelation and the burden, the primary focus of the biblical prophets um, is that final period that surrounds the return of Jesus. Now, most of the reformers were historicists. So they believe the book of Revelation is something that is unfolding throughout all of church history. And I'm curious, because I didn't sort of ask him directly, but I'm curious, Bill, are you a historicist or are you a futurist? You know, I uh, don't typically fall into those categories, if, if you can appreciate that. Um, you know, I know Thomas Ice, for instance, we get into all kinds of arguments because he's a consistent futurist. He doesn't think any of the prophecies can happen uh, really apart from being in the tribulation, et cetera. You know, Joel, I, I basically just, I look at the same thing you're looking at, the book of Revelation. Some of those things, in my estimation, uh, were relevant. So Mystery Babylon, Babylon was a code word back at the time of John. Even you mentioned that uh, when you uh, Peter had used it in your book. And, uh, you know, the, the like I said, so basically I believe that we have, uh, the city set on seven hills. I believe we have a history there. I believe that, you know, but the fulfillment of the Harlot World Religion, Revelation 17, is yet future. And, you know, although I believe as we go through time, you have the blood of the saints on the Catholic Church's hands. Um, you have, you know, the, it even says in Revelation 18, 20, that uh, God is avenging the blood of Mystery Babylon uh, on the, for the holy apostles and the prophets. And you look back at the time of uh, well, the holy apostles that were killed at the authority of Rome were Peter and Paul and Andrew and Jesus's brother, James. You know, there were none of them would, you know, what holy apostles were avenged in New York, would be avenged in New York City or Babylon, Iraq or Mecca. You know, the, of course, they were not right. uh, killed under that authority. So, I mean, you know, basically, I believe that, you know, it's it's got history, but also it's got future with respects to uh, the 10 kings okay. are going to desolate it. That's definitely a future event, this sort of thing. It's the, the, the harlot world religion is at work, but until Satan is no longer restrained, I don't believe he's going to come forward. I don't believe we're going to really see how bad it really is, how messy it is, to use your words. Sure, sure. So you technically, just for clarity, because once you say it's both historical and futurist, um, then, for all intents and purposes, you're essentially arguing for a historicist position. And this is this is part of why I was almost a little bit confused during the debate, because I assumed that you're a futurist. And so, you know, once we say Revelation is talking about the 1500s and going all the way back to the first century and really spanning all of church history, and that's its focus, um, then we're arguing for historicism. And again, that's not to say that it doesn't have profound end time meaning. It's now I'm not a rigid hyper futurist like Thomas Ice. He says everything must be contained within that final seven years. I don't see that. I just think that um, its primary focus is indeed the last days. Another point that I would highlight is when we say that the city of Rome was guilty for the shed blood of the Christians for the first few hundred years, and then, you know, the millions of, of one and a half million Jews in 70 AD. Um, the only issue there that has any continuity with the Catholic Church is the location. Um, but that was pagan Rome. Those are the Caesars, they're worshiping Jupiter and so forth. And other than the location, we can't say Rome is responsible for that because a city itself is not responsible for anything, but rather the Catholic Church um, is what we're pointing to today. So it's difficult to conflate the sins of pagan Rome with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, we have to sort of choose which one is the system of the Antichrist. But when we kind of start mixing the two, um, you know, then we could basically say, well, Islam is the same thing as you know, ancient Assyrian, false religion, or, you know, any of these. And yes, there are, there's some historical continuity in terms of, let's say, the spiritual realities. You know, it's ultimately Satan behind the scenes. Um, but we sort of have to choose, you know, are we, are we pointing to the Vatican or are we pointing to 
the false pagan worship of, of Rome of the first century. But other than the city, there's really no uh, commonalities there. Well, the, the, it is a city that is being judged. Initially, the seven, the ten kings in Revelation 17, 16 are desolating, in my estimation, a system to pave the way. It says they give their authority to the beast, you know, in that one hour. So then you have the beast's opportunity to come forward and put his kingdom together. No one will buy or sell unless they worship him, et cetera, and take a mark in their right hand upon their foreheads, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it's a city that ultimately gets destroyed. It is never to be found anymore. So what I do is basically track the history of the city. You know, are we to say that Rome's going to get a pass? Sodom and Gomorrah didn't get a pass. Ultimately, Nineveh was also destroyed down the road. So, you know, I'm just tracking the history from pagan Rome that then uh, morphed into papal Rome. Uh, and, and they all were centered in that city through which all these, you know, heinous things occurred. So that's right. sort of my explanation of those connections. Right. Well, so uh, here's the thing, though, is you and I get a pass on the Day of Judgment because we've been washed in the blood, because we've asked for forgiveness. And the Catholic Church, again, and this is important to highlight, for all of its shed blood during those times, the Catholic kingdoms versus the Protestant kingdoms, um, for all that they've the blood that they've shed, you know, we can cite a handful of times that the popes, even over just the past century, had made very public apologies and asked for forgiveness and actually acknowledged their sins and asked Protestants and said, you know, we've sinned as the Catholic Church, we've sinned and we've committed all of these things, not only against Protestants, but against Jews um, during World War II, against gypsies and this sort of thing. So, we have to say, if someone acknowledges their sins, ask for forgiveness, are they forgiven or will the Lord still hold them accountable? Well, I, and I understand you put forward that argument in your book. Um, I, we're, again, we're dealing with what's yet future at a time when the world is in utter chaos. It's messy, in the, to use your words, and a yeah. world religion will be called upon to bring some conditions of normalcy into it and uh, i believe at that point you know peace is taken from the earth with the second horseman uh you know death in hades is on the scene with the fourth horseman there's famines plagues and pestilences with the black horseman you know it's not the same world we're looking at right now um right. so at, at this point i would say that you know although i appreciate your argument there um i i, I think we have to look into the future and say you know there's it's a highly likelihood that they're gonna, there's going to be a repeat performance harlot is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus yet future. So um, I'm looking at their history, and I do believe this is a city that is going to have to be judged. And it is the city that did uh, ha kill two or more of the holy apostles if there is a connection with Revelation 18, 20. Right, right, right. But I, I guess what I'm saying is if they've acknowledged their sins for the sins of those killed during the Reformation— and ask for forgiveness, will they be judged for that those historical events, or will, it, will their judgment primarily be for events that will unfold in the future? So if, if they've repented and acknowledged that, will his judgments fall because of events of the past, or is that now forgiven? Well, I, I would turn the audience's attention to Revelation chapter 2, the letter to the church of Thyatira. This, unfortunately, we didn't even get a chance to talk about this in the debate. I've got a new DVD coming out called The Catholic Church and the Tribulation. And I point forward the prophetic applications of the seven letters to the seven churches. They have multiple applications. Yes, there were seven churches, but there are prophetic applications. And that church, we're told in Revelation chapter 2, will be cast into the sickbed of the great tribulation. And it says God will kill her children as a result, because of a doctrine of Jezebel that comes out of the depths of Satan, we're told. So I would invite your audience, Tony, to read Revelation chapter 2, and of course keep an eye out for my a DVD called The Catholic Church and the Tribulation. I believe they, they're they certainly not looking for a rapture. They are all millennial. Um, they, they, I believe they're going to go through the tribulation, and I believe there's a proof text for that in Revelation chapter 2. I want to come back quickly to Revelation chapter 13, um, and basically it says that the the beast coming up out of the earth had two horns, like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. Uh, the lamb, does that not signify 
some sort of tie with Christianity. So, um, and speaking like a dragon, we know who the dragon is. The dragon is Satan. We're told that quite clearly. Is an apostate church uh, fitting the the bill of the lamb side of things? And also, I'm somebody else pointed out to me in the last few days that there's a huge move within Christianity. Uh, a move called dominionism or the new apostolic reformation that is pushing a doctrine of dominionism where the Christianity has to sort of pave the way for Jesus uh, and they have a seven mountains theology. Is it possible that the seven mountains um, spoken of is not actually a city that sits on seven literal hills, but is it perhaps some sort of uh, metaphorical, spiritual kind of application to the whole thing because they're clearly well, teaching it and that actual doctrine is a lot of those people are going back to Rome they're the same people that are pushing those doctrines uh, kind of sending everyone back towards Rome either directly or indirectly well you know the the problem with getting you know trying to expand the definition of the Greek word of the seven hills it's oros and you know some people, some translations call it mountains, some call it hills, like the NLT, NIV, CEV, AMP, GNT. See, there's a long list of many B call them, translated as hills. Uh, the Strong's Concordance says it can mean rendered as hills or mountains, uh, depending on the context. You know, there's some people who try to promote the fact that New York City is uh, the, the harlot city, and America is the harlot per se. And when they come to that verse, they try to, in some often cases, say, well, it really sits on seven continents. But, you know, the true definition of the word is not continents. It's not nebulous. It's hills or mountains. It's used many times in the Bible as hills or mountains. So I would I would deviate from that thinking. So does Islam fit the lamb, Joel? Revelation 13, where the beast has to come out, uh, look, it has two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Because, you know, when you look at Bible, what does the lamb generally signify? It's generally associated with Christ uh, and with, you know, with the church. So how does that fit with Islam? Yeah, no, it's interesting because, uh, you know, Jesus said, beware of false prophets. They come to you as, as wolves in sheep's clothing. And then here in Revelation, you have the false prophet. And he has the appearance of a ram, you know, an adult or a male lamb, except it's actually a dragon. So this is actually Satan that seems to be masquerading as Jesus. And what's interesting about that is that when you look at actual Islamic doctrine concerning the last days, their prophecies, they teach that Jesus comes back as a Muslim Uh, And he tells all the Christians of the world that you've been deceived, your Bible has been corrupted, that he never claimed to be the son of God. He never actually died on the cross. It was just an illusion. And what's also interesting is that according to their prophecies, he comes back uh, as an assistant or subservient. He prays behind another individual known as the Mehdi, which is Islam's primary Messiah figure. And so, again, this is all speculation. Um, We don't base our interpretation of Scripture on false Islamic prophecy by any means. Um, However, it is certainly interesting to note what Satan has set up, the largest false religion in the world that just happens to surround Jerusalem, uh, what he has set them up to believe. They are awaiting a Messiah figure called the Mehdi, who in many ways resembles the Antichrist, And they're awaiting a Jesus that will come back claiming to be a Muslim, claiming that Islam is the one true religion, i.e. it will be the dragon clothed and pretending to be the Lamb of God. And so, again, it's speculation, but it's certainly something to consider that maybe Satan, Satan, he doesn't know the future, but he does understand the general story of Bible prophecy. Um, to consider the fact that through the false religion of Islam, through their false prophecies, for the past 1,400 years, he has been preparing his hordes. He has been preparing the Islamic world to receive the Antichrist as if he is their Messiah. 
and to receive a false prophet as if he is Jesus. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4 says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Are Muslims expecting the return of God as the Mahdi God? Is the Mahdi going to be able to set himself up and claim to be God? Are they going to accept that? Yeah, well, so here, let me ask you this question. What God will the Antichrist claim to be? Well, I personally, I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm correct, but my way of viewing it is that I actually think that the Antichrist will be indwelled by Lucifer himself or Satan and is going to want to be known and worshipped for who he truly is, that the gloves are going to come off, the cloak's coming off. No longer is Satan going to be content to be called Shiva or Allah or whatever that we're going to find that he's actually going to reveal himself for who he truly is and expect the people to worship him for who he actually is and that all the all the religions, all those that are deceived are going to fall for that, that he's God. Yeah. That's how I see it. Sure. The reason I ask that is because, in my opinion, I think that uh, Christians often misinterpret Second Thessalonians and the reason that they do that is because they don't recognize the Old Testament foundational passages that Paul was expounding upon. So the primary two texts that Paul was basing his statement on is Daniel 8 and Daniel 11. In Daniel 8, it says that the little horn, that's the Antichrist, will exalt himself to be even equal to the commander of the host. Of course, that's God, that's the or Jesus. That's the God of the temple. And then in Daniel 11, it, it has essentially what is the Antichrist statement of faith. It says that he shows no regard uh, for the God of his fathers, which of course is Elohim Ab. That's the God of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the God of the Bible. Um, and it sh he shows no regard for the desire of women. Uh, uh, many commentators believe that that is simply a... Uh, it's a, a euphemism, if you will, or a um, an idiom, I'm sorry, for the Messiah. So he denies the Father, he denies the Son. Now, of course, that lines perfectly with the Apostle John's statement regarding the doctrines of the Antichrist. And then it says he'll show no regards for any other gods. So he denies the Father, he denies the Son, he denies all these other gods. And then it says, but... There is a God that he will pay homage to, honor with costly stones, pearls, and so forth. So the Antichrist will have a God. And it says that this is a God of war, or a God of forces, or fortresses. Um, and so, you know, this is very important part of the equation. Um, I personally believe that the Antichrist will not essentially pull a David Koresh. He will not say, I am God. Rather, by sitting in God's seat, I believe that what Thessalonians is stating is that by sitting in the temple of God, he is declaring himself to be superior to God. He's, he's declaring himself to um, be better than the God of the temple that he's sitting in, because it says throughout Daniel that he will say unheard of things against the God of God. So you can't say, I am the God of the temple, and also say, terrible things about the God of the temple. That's contradictory. So whatever position we take, we have to have an Antichrist who has a God, and that's a God of war or a God of forces. Um, but he also denies the God of the Bible. He denies the Father. He denies the Son, and he denies every other God. So in my opinion, that would fit with a Muslim Antichrist much better um, than really any other scenario that I've heard. Now, again, admittedly, these are texts with some room for debate, uh, particularly, you know, Daniel 11. Um, but I think whatever position we take, we have to acknowledge that the Antichrist will have a God, and that is a God of war. So um, as our time is getting on, 
Joel, what can people actually expect in your book? Can you maybe give them a little bit of a rundown um, about the book itself? Sure. Well, so essentially, Mystery Babylon, what I've done is for the first time, I've really tried to detail the case for a uh, an Islamic-focused Mystery Babylon. Uh, again, centered in Mecca, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, I present all of the popular positions, and I try to work through the strengths and the weaknesses of all the positions. I don't take an overly dogmatic position with regard to Mecca. Um, when you write a book, you have to argue for something, but I'm not 100% convinced. I'm very open to other future possibilities. I think with regard to any future speculative eschatology, we need to be humble. The, the, the Lord knows the future. And we need to approach these things cautiously and humbly. Um, but I wanted to lay the case out for people to consider. I think it's um, when you first hear it without hearing it detailed, it can sound questionable. In fact, I was very dubious regarding this position myself until I really worked through the text and worked through the realities on the ground. And so that's what I that's what I attempted to do. Um, I think it's an important contribution to the discussion, and I think anybody who's a, a serious student of the scriptures should give it a, a serious reading and um, and then, you know, pray and seek the Lord and be a faithful Berean and come to their own conclusions. I really like that attitude. That's great. Um because we do this, you know, one of the hallmarks of the end times we know is going to be deception because that's spoken of a lot of lot of places. So we have yeah. to be careful that we're not deceived. And I think what a lot of people tend to do is they pigeonhole themselves into one position and then go later on, I've made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. So, you know, but the end of Daniel twelve four, you know, basically Daniel was told to shut up and seal the book till the time of the end. So, you know, we can try and formulate our position without having all the pieces in place. So uh, I think that'd be great. And uh, yeah, I definitely encourage people to get a hold of your book. That definitely sounds like something well worth reading. And what about you, Bill? What's the, the gist of your book? Yes. And, and I would just make a comment on Joel's book as well. I have read it. I When I read it, I complimented him on the enormous amount of research he did, the way he broke down the different arguments on the great city, of course, at this point for us, it's mystery Babylon. It's a mystery. We're, we're looking at a point, that probably not in the too distant future, where it will no longer be a mystery. It'll be a reality for unsuspecting humanity. And because it's a mystery at this point, you know, you got these difficult to understand. It's five different cities. We talked about who they are. Um, but I did tell Joel, I, although I do appreciate the research. I'm just not going with them on the conclusions, but I do recommend his book for people to read it because at the very least, they're going to get an enormous amount of wonderful research on Islam, Mecca, uh, the different arguments about Babylon, etc. My my book is called Apocalypse Road Revelation for the Final Generation, and it's dealing with, I believe we're living in the last days, deep in the last days, probably are the, the final generation. And I wanted to put forward information that happens with respects, it comes at them full throttle with respects to the, the messy uh, parts of the world that Joel was talking about with the, the harlot world religion, uh, the, the martyrdom that's going to come, the, the apocalypse, the, the sealed judgment. So I get into those types of things and try to lay them out in a commentary. But it's also a book. It's book two of a trilogy. The first book was called Revelation Road, Hope for Beyond the Horizon, that ended with the church age. And what we have is a novel and a commentary, a very unique form of book in both these Revelation Road and Apocalypse Road. How will we experience these events, a, a modern family, as they go through the Middle East wars and uh, the destruction of Damascus and Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38? And what about the four horsemen? How, how will a family go through those things? And then I do a commentary at the second half of the book explaining why I said what I said within each chapter. Now, my book's available at prophecydepot.com or amazon.com. And uh, But the main emphasis what came out of Joel's in my book is this wonderful DVD debate where we really just lay out some very powerful uh, research and arguments about two primary candidate cities, Mecca and Rome. So that's also available at uh, Joel's website, Amazon, or my website, prophecydepot.com. And Joel, give your website again. Yeah, I'm at uh, joelstrumpet.com. And uh, yeah, and let me just, if I could compliment Bill in return, um, 
Bill is a, uh, a committed student of the scriptures. He's a tremendous researcher as well, an excellent author, and a gentleman and a brother. And I, I really just want to express my appreciation for him. And, um, you know, even just reiterate the fact that if anyone is listening to this who's Catholic, um, the issue, and I'm someone who, by the way, I was raised very nominally Catholic until I was about 11 years old. But this issue of um, the Marian apparitions and some of these uh, Eucharistic miracles, this is something that anyone who um, is a student of the scriptures, they should be very, very concerned about. And um, I would appeal to anyone, again, who may be listening to this who is Catholic, um, to carefully consider the, the, the deception of some of these pseudo miracles and um, to turn to the purity of following Jesus apart from uh, all of these man-made innovations, I think, that have heaped themselves upon Rome over the years and, um, and give themselves to the purity of simply being a disciple of Jesus. So just to finish off then, what is a disciple of Jesus? I mean, there may be some people that are listening to this that don't even that aren't even Christians that don't actually even know what a true disciple is. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, being a disciple of Jesus begins by completely transferring your faith from your own righteousness uh, entirely onto Jesus, onto God the Father through Jesus, who died on the cross to make atonement according to to the scriptures for our sins. So it's someone who has transferred their faith fully onto Jesus, no longer relying on themselves or their own righteousness or their ability to earn or deserve uh, eternal rewards, heaven, and someone who then goes on to uh, give themselves to obedience through the empowerment of the indwelling Holy Spirit. When we say yes to Jesus, it says that we are born from above. We've been born already physically, but when we put our faith in Jesus, it says that his spirit comes to indwell us and he empowers us to live a life of obedience, which we don't do it to earn heaven. We don't do it to earn or curry God's favor. Rather, we do it um, because we he loved us first and we love him back. It's a very simple relationship. It's the most natural thing in the world to honor and serve our creator. And um, if you've never done that, if anyone's listening, I would say this is the single most important decision that you could make, not only in this lifetime, but literally for all of eternity. Have you got any closing thoughts, Bill? Well, uh, I want to close with the same spirit of love that Joel just did to reach out to your audience regarding that relationship with Jesus Christ. It is the most important decision they can make. Joel presented uh, the major importance of the gospel. The the other aspect within that, the good news, is that Christ rose from the grave. According to the scriptures, we were told he would do that. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. By resurrecting from the grave, that he can now fulfill that everlasting life uh, reality. Uh, you, you receive Christ now and you receive everlasting life. You also receive an abundant life right now. You don't go through this world alone. You realize that you, you are walking with God in relationship. Um, you know, I'll be speaking in April at a conference, a World Apologetics Conference, with one of the speakers is Lee Strobel who came out and wrote a book called The Case for Christ, and now it's been turned into a movie. And he tested the resurrection. He, his wife became a believer, and he was a, a, a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And he tested, he, he was trying to, you know, convince his wife that, that you know, that Christ didn't resurrect and that he, she, her faith was futile. And he found, as he checked all the evidence, that the resurrection was real and, and authenticated. Uh, authentic it. So basically, I would say to people that what Joel said, and couple that with the resurrection, you need to you need to inquire into this, and make make your decision for Christ. Don't wait for the harlot world religion to come upon you. So that's my closing arguments there for the fact that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Joel, have you got any last thoughts? No, I would just say I would just give my hearty amen to that, and um, and to say it's something that you will absolutely never regret. Well, I want to thank both of you um, two guys, Joel Richardson and Bill Solis. That was a really great um, 
wrap up I think great interview I thoroughly enjoyed it love the way that you interact with each other and you know the spirit behind it also I want to thank you very much for coming on the A Minute to Midnight show thanks Paul Folks, A Minute to Midnight is run 100% by donations. You can find a donation button on our website and actually a donation page on our website, a minute to midnight.com. And we put all of our shows and articles on our website, as well as you can find the shows on YouTube and iTunes. So you have a few options there. I write, play and record all the music that you find in our shows as well and you can find some free music for download on the A Minute to Midnight website too. We have a Facebook group which you're welcome to join, just make sure if you search it that you put A Minute to Midnight as separate words and spell Midnight M-I-D-N-I-T-E. We have a community forum on our website as well which you're welcome to join. So on behalf of the A Minute to Midnight team, I want to thank you for listening today and I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll catch you in another show very soon. Until then, God bless and this is Tony signing out.